cases to serial killers, missing persons, and more. 100% he did this. I'd go off in the fantasy world. How much more lucky can you get that you're not on death row? You want to know what we know? My name is Jay. This is Guilty of Crime. Hello, everybody. I'm back. It's Jay with Guilty of Crime. And before we get started today, I wanted to thank everybody that helped me not only hit the 1000 sub mark, but I also hit a lot past that. I'm, I believe at, uh, you know, 1.2 3,000 or something like that, but that's amazing for liking, sharing, subscribing, and guess what? We also hit that 50,000 mark for Deception Detective. That means that he's going to keep making those videos for us in the community regarding Madeline Soto. So I got a message back from him. I posted in his community. I let him know. And he sent me back a message and said he hit the 50,000 mark, which means we're going to see more. Now, if you went to his page, you'll notice that it's not that he's a true crime guy. It's that he's into the showing how people are deceptive. So we're going to collaborate some more. We made that mark, everybody. You guys were all here. I wanted to thank you. And today, I noticed you guys all had a lot of questions last night when we were doing this live. People were asking, where's Jen Soto during the party? Where was she at night? We had a lot more questions than answers. And that's not what we were really doing last night. Last night we were talking about, or we were breaking down the lies and exposing Jen Soto. Well, guess what? She's exposed now. And I'm going to show you how. I'm going to show you that YouTubers, you guys are all, all of us are making a difference and we're impacting the actual news social media youtubers are hitting the news and everybody's collaborating and that's what's coming up for you but we're also what else is coming up is now we know stefan stearns was at the birthday party and jen soto wasn't so where was she the day of the birthday party and the night of her birthday party where was she stefan was there and we're going to show you we've got video we're going to talk about the flat tire and much more Hopefully, this will answer some of your questions. I cannot wait. I've been thinking about it all morning, and that's why I came on early today. So, let's get started, and I'll share some of the social media things while we're going. Hit that like, subscribe button, everybody, and let's watch this. I'll comment on it, but we're answering questions with this. Madeline Soto's 13th birthday party was on Sunday, February 25th. The party was at a relative's house and she was surrounded by family. But one person who wasn't there was her mother, Jen Soto. She was working. Madeline's mother and father were not together. In fact, her dad married another woman a couple of months after she was born. But there was a man living in her house. Her mom's boyfriend, Stefan Stearns. Stearns was at the birthday party and at some point after the party and before she was supposed to be at school the following day madeline was murdered stearns is the prime suspect because he was the last known person to be with her and he is alleged to have hundreds of disturbing photos on his phone of madeline being sexually abused investigators are putting together a timeline they have gathered surveillance video from the complex where they lived tracking stern's movements they also have license plate reader information and eyewitness statements all connected to stern's and his car tonight we'll take a look at that evidence and identify what's missing and what it means as we continue our investigation into the tragic life and death yeah, everybody, what's missing and what it means? Well, Jennifer Soto's missing, and let's talk about what it means. And we're going to get into that. Of course, I have to talk because it's my channel, and I'm bringing you the content as fast as it comes and as much as information as we can get. So that's what we're doing here today. Ex hashtag expose Jen Soto, all of that. So let's keep going. What does it mean? And everybody's asking, who was at the birthday party? Why is nobody talking? Where are the photos? We're going to answer that right now. Let's go. Of Madeline Soto. 
Uh, Vinny Politan, thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And in this case involving Madeline Soto, looking at all the evidence and, and what we know at this point, what has been made public at this point by statements by investigators, statements by Stephen Stearns, Jen Soto, um, others who were um, at the house or at the party that day, it's just not clear what was happening. It is not clear what was happening between the time of that party and the time that Madeline was supposed to show up at school. And the more you focus in on that actual morning, based on the timeline that's being established, um, the less you it, know. None, none of it makes sense. It doesn't right. make sense to me. Something weird was happening. And, and is it panic? Is it, I don't know what it is. But what I do know is, is when you try to like put it together in some logical form, some of the actions and 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 things that are time stamped that we know uh, happened that morning, it still is confusing. Because and it starts because of Stephen Stearns. I mean, his activities that day suspicious to say the least. Now, we know he's got problems. We know he's been arrested, not charged with the murder, but a prime suspect in the murder, but puts himself as the last known person to be with the victim in this case. But you know who would help us? Jennifer Soto, since she was in the house that night as well, and they were all in the same house, even though he didn't live there. So Jen Soto is the one missing piece that we're going to hear about, and that will get us to know what happened because she's the only one that probably does know except for Maddie and Stefan's not talking. And then we know what was on his phone. Hundreds of images of, of Madeline being sexually abused and him being the abuser. Those are the allegations against him. So that's obviously suspicious to say the, the least about it, but just what he was doing that morning, like, why? Why is he up so early? Why is he driving seemingly in and out of the complex? Where is he going? You all Where are going to see. Go? Where was he leaving? Why was he returning? Why is he at the dumpster? Why is he driving back at 819 with Madeline in the car? Was it Maddie? The school starts at 930. None of Was this it makes just sense. And when, and when you look at this timeline, it, you, you're trying to figure out what does it tell us about whether it's the flat tire driving on the other side uh, of, 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 it's not even the town, he's in another city. I mean, he's driving 22 miles away to do what? Like at least Scott Peterson told us, oh yeah, I went fishing in the bay. Well, we know what he was doing there, but at least he had a story for it. There was never a story from Stephen Stearns about why he's driving around St. Cloud that day when he lives in Kissimmee, and I don't think he has a job. Yeah, wait for it while he works this out. And I don't want to fast forward it because I want to respect him with his thoughts as well, but there's a lot coming right now, and you have to see it to understand what I'm saying. But, yeah, work it out, Vinny. Work it out really uh, suspicious and, and then what what does it mean that he's there at one o'clock and then all this activity in the morning the dumpster driving away from the school driving back into the complex and then saying that he goes back out does what does it mean what does it tell us tonight we're going to try to dig a little deeper into all of it to try to make some sense of it, of what it could mean in this case. What it does mean. I mean, my gut reaction is telling me this is just utter panic. Utter panic. That, that you know, things happened. He's not prepared for it. And this is what we talked about last night, everybody. So he hasn't analyzed those two the way we have. So he's just working it out in his head. But yeah, we saw the panic. And now he's scrambling. But then you look at the one other thing, like Jen Soto. Why, why is her story somehow corroborating his story? You know, there's two explanations for it. One, he's 
She's, she's being uh, forced to say it, um, threatened to say it, just parrots whatever he says because he c controls her in some way, or she's just flat out lying and covering for him. That's what we think. Let's take a listen to Jen Soto. Quickly. Because this, you look at what happened to Madeline, all of this is taking place um, at her birthday party, right? She's alive at her birthday party turning 13, which leaves the question, when was she murdered? Right. She's celebrating. She's got her birthday dress on. There's people over a relative's house. We think it's grandma's house. There's a cake. There's like everything that's normal, seemingly normal on this day. Except one thing, that's not normal. We plan the child's birthday party celebration with relatives on a day when mom can't make it? Like mom's not there? No, Vinny. But the alleged sex abuser is there? Yes, And the Vinny. rest of the family? Let's take a listen to the interview from WFTV, Jen Soto, again, talking about this is the last time that, that we know she's alive, the birthday party. She had a birthday party on Sunday. Uh, she had a great time. Uh, I couldn't make it because I was working, but she had an amazing time. She was so happy with all her gifts. Uh, I, I told her good night and um, yeah, that was it. Told her. All right, we've seen this video a ton of times, and I'm not fast-forwarding, but I have to stop for Vicki Maynard, who says, why isn't anyone thinking that Jen did it and not Stefan? We just don't know. And what you also say is you think that it was Jen in the car, not Maddie, the dead Maddie. And I agree with you. I said that's a good possibility. I'm not putting in that any, so you know, I'm not solidifying that, but that is one of my thoughts. And if you go back to my live last night and watch it, Vicki, that's what I say. So. We're all on the same page here, I think. Good night where? Back home? Mm -hmm. Did, were, were you back home and was everyone there? Was she dropped off? Were you talking to her on the phone? I don't know. Is this the last time you talked to your daughter? I, I just think the description would be a little more specific. I mean, at that point, the body of Madeline hasn't been found. She's a missing child, but still your child is missing. That's never good. Yeah, I told her good night and that was it. That was it. There was nothing else to it. Nothing else happening. Where's everybody else? Where are you? Did you come back from work yet? Because your mother said you worked late and you're real tired the next morning. So let's go All back right. to the party now because we do have some video, video from that party. Uh, this is from TikTok and it's um, Madeline and you'll actually get to hear her. It's like I said, everybody, social media, hardcore is crossing over into the news right now. And this is not all, just this episode's gonna do the same thing the whole way through. So stay tuned, keep watching, there's video. So we know that she was alive and at the birthday party, everybody. It's a, it's a short video, but it, it tells me one thing. When it's, it's, it's a party, right? It's a party. So people take pictures and videos of the birthday girl. Take a look. She seems, she seems to me older, older than, than what I was thinking from just the, the images of her, you know, her voice, she just seems more mature. I wonder if that's Watch. playing a role. We'll go back for a second just so we can. It went really quick. Let's go back for a second and just watch it again. This is the day of her birthday. And yes, it's confirmed. It was one of her friends recording it. They've talked to all the people. We just haven't heard anything yet. Okay. 
she seems she seems to me older older than than what i was thinking from just the the images of her you know her voice she just seems more mature i wonder if that's playing a role in everything that happened to her she's now growing up let me bring in my guests joining me in miami florida co-host of surviving the survivor podcast you need to watch it joel waldman is with us in orlando florida editor of the osceola news gazette ken jackson and in los angeles board certified forensic psychiatrist trial expert with and there you go it's the first of many that are coming up joel sts nation i love him and there's more to come guys just can't wait i'm excited and, this, and columnist dr carol lieberman dr lieberman i'll start with you in that short video that we just saw of Madeline on her 13th birthday, did anything strike you about that video? Whether it's the way she was acting, the way she presented herself. To me, it's the first time I've heard her talk. Yes. Um, I wanted more. <laughs> That's what was the first thing I thought. Um, in a way, I mean, in a way, it's, she does seem older. Of course, you know, she's been through a lot since eight years old. She's had to uh, grow up. The other thing is, do you notice how she looks, other than being younger, she she looks similar to her mother? And I think that may well have played a role in the abuse. You know, even when, they, especially when they wear glasses, both wear glasses, um, there's a real similarity. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I see it and I and I see it in that video more than more than anywhere. Joel, uh, first time I've get got to speak to you about this case, and I know you're covering it in depth as well. What questions do you have about this birthday party? I mean, to me, this is such a significant event. This is the last time that she's interacting with people. It's the last time she's known to be alive. And it just seems like there should be a, a treasure trove of information coming out of that party. Yeah, well, uh, kudos to you, Vinny, and thank you for having me back on uh, for asking all those difficult questions. I mean, these are all the questions that a reporter should be asking, and I've asked them yes. myself. I can tell you from personal experience, I have a book out, I'm going on a book tour, and this morning, my wife said, how on earth are you going to miss your five-year-old uh, birthday? And I said, you know, look, I'll do whatever I can, maybe we can push it up, but without question your question about why the mother jennifer soto was not there on the day of the birthday is the most pressing and most alarming question to me albeit her grandmother was there but it is so odd my wife would never miss uh one of my young children's birthdays got a 10 an 8 and a 5 year old she uh, makes it a point you know she's organizing six months out so for a mom not to be there and i get it look people come up on hard times they have to work maybe she had to be at work but you'd think that they would arrange it in such a way. And this just leads me back, and of course the psychologist can talk more about this, about this very uh, seemingly unusual relationship between Jennifer and Stefan Stearns. We've all seen by now these local TV interviews, the ones where he's pacing uh, back and forth behind her. He almost looks like a, a bouncer at a bar. There's a weird control issue going on there. There's that picture of him with the devil. If you watch Netflix, the show Lucifer... He looks like a, the devil, but just really evil. Now, yes, this is social media and YouTube crossing into the news and helping the crime community. So thank you all so much. And thank all of these people that are on social media doing this. So I am most curious to know why the mother was not at the birth. Ken Jackson, this birthday party and... There's a lot of people there, it seems, but we're not hearing from a lot of people that were there. Hopefully they have spoken and given a lot of information to investigators about that day. But what, what surprised me was is this did not begin as a homicide investigation. It began as a missing persons case. And everyone at that yeah, party it has significant information. And I would have thought if you were at the party and she goes missing the next day, everybody would be out talking about what happened the day before, trying to draw. Well, they can't be out talking about it because the police are talking to them right now and trying to nail down a timeline. So that's what we're doing right now. We're ahead of it here on social media. They're not even analyzing behavior or talking about the things that we're talking about. 
like last night's live. They're not saying any of that stuff. They're just telling us what they know. And we're going to see people at the birthday party. And one person in particular. Of some leads in, in all of this. Right. Well, and, and you're right. This was a missing persons case from the Monday when she was reported missing to the Wednesday when we heard from Orange County Sheriff John Mina said, no, we have good, good information that she is dead. Um, it is also my understanding that everybody that's been at that party uh, has been uh, interviewed by investigators, may have a hand in why this investigation is taking a while from Kissimmee police. Um, something that, I, uh, you know, we've gone around and I've mentioned it, how a mother would not be at her daughter's 13th birthday party. I mean, she's becoming a teenager. Um, when we think that the party was at a grandparent's house, makes me wonder, did the grandparents actually put it on plan it have all the hand in it and uh, jen the mom was just sort of detached from it and was like well i'm 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 going to be at work and you know like, like you guys said you know, there, that, there's no way you would miss that that's a great point because uh my guess is you know she's working she's struggling our guess is jealousy and that there was a weird love triangle and when you see it in her body language and you see her actions you wouldn't plan a birthday party on a sunday and not be there you would plan a birthday party on a day that you don't have to work and it doesn't matter what day it is so we all think and i think and whoever thinks it she's we're exposing her right now and she was not there on purpose. Struggling the keynote you know, to stay ahead as a single mom, Stefan Stearns. I can't. I just don't think he's contributing anything to this home other than pain. Um, let's take a look. Let's take a closer look at who may have been at that party because there's a few clues when you look first at the picture we're looking at now. If you take a look at it on the right side of the of the picture, you see a reflection. We're going to put a little outline there so you can kind of see where we're drawing your attention to. It looks like a man all the way on the right standing, much larger, with a hat on, it appears. And then to the left of there, it looks like you have a couple of people sitting down. And I was like, well, who else is at this party? Is it just men or is it like a bunch of people? Then we took a look. Uh, I got a little tip from Gray Hughes to take a look at the balloons. And if you look in the balloons, wait a minute. I'm pausing it, first of all, so you could see the balloons, everybody, and see the people that were there. And secondly, you heard that right, Gray Hughes. Who's Gray Hughes? A YouTuber that's always on these news episodes, Court TV all of this, we're all bombarding the news and we're helping them. Gray Hughes did that and he sent that over. So, yeah, let's keep watching. I just wanted to pause it so you can see the people in it and see that Stefan Stearns was there. There's reflections. You get a much, uh, I think, clearer picture that, hey, there's, there's a bunch of folks there and they're taking pictures as well. Looks like a guy's got a, a cell phone going right there. Um, I look on the right-hand side on that balloon. That almost, to me, looks like grandma. Um, people could disagree, but that the, the balloon on the right, the balloon on the left, I see, you know, at least one, two, three, four, looks like at least six people there. So um, there, there are things happening. There's people there. Um, Dr. Carol Lieberman, these are people you want to talk to. You want to talk about how was she acting? Was and, and what was the dynamic? Like, who was there at the end of the party? Who did she leave the party? Did she stay at grandma's? Did Stefan Stern's drive her somewhere? These are the these are the questions um, that and, and information I think those folks would have that is significant. And I wonder, uh, I've got to think they're all gonna volunteer that information. Well, um, one would hope. Um, yes, they could have really provide a lot of good information, particularly about the relationship. Um, between Madeline and Stefan. You know, did she try to spend a lot of time with him? Did she try to not? Was she like trying to be away from him during the night? Um, was she talking to other people, you know, other men or, um, you know, yes, they would have a lot of information. You know what else? Um, That's going to come out soon, everybody. How many people were there? Her friends were the ones taking the pictures and the videos for TikTok. So all of that's going to come out really soon. They're just crossing their T's and dotting their I's. In the meantime, we want more information. We want to know, we want to expose Jen and know that we we all think and let everyone know that we think that she is guilty of 
some crime. We don't know what. We're all in chat, chatting and talking about it. And so are these people. Her teachers. I hope that the police are talking to her teachers, all the teachers from age eight up you know, to the present, because they really should have and would have, uh, maybe they didn't realize what they were watching, but they would have a lot of information because they would have seen or should have seen, should have realized um, from the time that she was beginning to be abused, there are signs. I mean, I, I'm not to trying to put it all on the teachers, but there are signs that teachers could have seen, you know, things like, um, was she very quiet? Was she anxious? Was she depressed? Did she not like to be touched? Um, did she not like to be too close to people? Did she act out in school? Now I know uh, she, her mother said that she had ADHD and I know that there was some talk about her possibly being on the autism spectrum. So some of these symptoms um, of abuse could also be symptoms of those disorders. So, uh, you know, of course it's hard to tease these things and the grandma also said that she didn't like, the grandma and the mom said she didn't like to sleep alone. She was very scared and shy. That tells a lot. But it certainly is worth talking to all of her teachers um, intensively and seeing whether they can tell something, whether they can see also her progression over the years. You know, did she get more and more withdrawn? Whatever, some kind of sign that there was something going on. Just like we talked about, the mother should have noticed that there were certain signs. The teachers could well have noticed too. Joel, I want to show you some more pictures from the birthday party uh, from TikTok that were posted. And this this go. made it very clear that the party was not at their home because this is a completely different neighborhood, different types of homes. Um, but it's incredibly tragic, Joel, to look at this and think about what this symbolizes. Like this is this is her last moments, perhaps of of, of happiness on earth. You know, trying to grab some happiness in between the abuse that was taking a pla taking place. But this was it like your 13th birthday party, and then someone takes your life. It is uh, unthinkable. It's a cliche in news. It's a parent's worst nightmare. And uh, sadly, in this case, we, we don't yet know if it was this parent's worst nightmare. You'd like to think that that's the way she feels. Uh, but again, there's so much to unravel here between the relationship uh, between Jennifer Soto and her boyfriend, Stefan Starnes. There are so many alarms that, that go off. There are reports that the mother, Jennifer Soto, was letting uh, Stefan Stearns uh, sleep in bed with him, which obviously is really incredibly disturbing. And then for me, one of the questions that I have, and I've asked investigators, was this a premeditated killing or was this an impulse killing? And was the trigger the 13th birthday? Uh, obviously, we keep going back to this 13th birthday. We know this abuse was going on for at least two years uh, that's what authorities say. But he was living with them for like seven years, I believe it is. And uh, you have to wonder, did it go on even beyond that? Since 2018, everybody. So keep that in mind. It was a lot longer than we know. Yeah, but uh, disturbing all around, to say the least. A big thanks to Dr. Carol Lieberman. Uh, Joel and Ken are going to stay with us. Uh, when we come back, we are going to take a look at that timeline and try to make sense of what could have been happening in that chaotic morning that she was reported missing plus coming up next hour and we're not watching the next hour because we're not watching p diddy that's a whole other topic moved her body in the early morning hours but moved it from where to where and what was the purpose we know where she was found but what was the purpose in the early morning hours? But let's go back to this timeline, timeline, timeline. 7.35 on video. We've seen where the cameras are. Stearns is discarding Madeline's backpack and school laptop in the dumpster at the Phoenician Bay Villages complex, okay? That is near the back uh, exit slash entrance to the uh, complex. 8.10 a.m., a license plate reader catches Stern's plates driving away from Hunters Creek Middle School. How far from the school were they? Um, how close were they? That's not clear. But that's at 8.10. And we know nine minutes later, 
Stearns is returning to Venetian Bay apartment complex and Madeline can be seen in the vehicle. And that's when police believe she is deceased at the time on that video. At eight but this is where the discrepancy comes in for me because it's not confirmed that it's her. We haven't seen that video. And my speculation is that it may be she's in the backseat or somewhere else. And that is the mom. So we don't, we don't actually know. They're saying that, but Vinny's not the police either. 819. Returning home. Why? What for? And where was he before that? And then later in the day, hours later, one between 1 and 2.30, Stearns is spotted in the St. Cloud area. Again, this is like, you know, 17 to 22 miles away, changing a flat tire. And we're going we're gonna to go into detail on the flat tire in a minute. But I want to focus uh, in the next segment. But I want to focus here on this 7.35, 8.10, 8.19. What's going on? Still with me, the co-host of the Surviving the Survivor podcast, Joel Waldman, and the editor of the Osceola News Gazette, Ken Jackson, and joining us in Portland, Oregon, podcaster Gray Hughes of Gray Hughes Investigates. There you go. Um, Gray, let me start with you on this. Where he's moving the body, that's what they're saying. He's moving her body in the morning. If he's at the dumpster at 735, and then... At 8.10, is seen driving away from Hunter's Creek, where, wherever in the area he is at that point, but moving, not going towards the school, but is driving in the opposite direction from that school at 8. The big question was, where was Jen Soto at this time, and why isn't she filling that gap in for us all? Why don't we know what happened between the party at night and in the morning when we saw Stefan dumping her backpack? She's the only one that can tell us besides Stefan. Why isn't she telling us, everybody? She's not telling us because she's involved. And she let this happen for way too long. And I bet you there's a lot more. They're even, I mean, these guys are saying it. Ten, where'd he go? What, what, what would be the purpose of any of this? Yeah, I mean, that's the part that's really strange. At um, I think it was, you know, remember we talked about the other day, 1149, he's on that app. So maybe something happened to Madeline in the early morning hours. I don't think people consider 819 and 745 early morning hours. That's just sort of nor normal morning hours, right? So it seems like something would have happened before that. But then you look at like, okay, 745, he's putting the laptop and the backpack in the dumpster. And then he leaves. So you would assume that she's in the car. I think he leaves. I mean, we don't actually know if he's leaving then, but he does come back at 819. So obviously he left after 745. He leaves and then he comes back and she's seen in the car and they believe she's not alive. So did he put her somewhere first and then go, oh man, that's not a good spot. And then go get her and then bring her back. And then what's crazy is... At, that's, you know, 819, where was Madeline before he left the apartment at like 1230 to show up where his car had the... That's the question of the year, everybody. And I think we're going to find out real soon. Flat tire at 120. I mean, that's like four hours where she's just... Four, four hours, car. right? What, 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 right. Ken Jackson, you know, I'm looking at this timeline, you know, 735 throwing the backpack out. He, he's near the back of the complex. So if he leaves there at like 740 or something, you would be, you could get to the school by about 8 o'clock. And then if you left the school, you'd probably be back at around 819. Um, I don't know where this license plate reader is, but it, it it's, it's not... It seems like she's got to be already dead at this point because it doesn't seem like there's enough time in any of this drive. And why would you get rid of the laptop and the backpack if she's still alive, right? That part, I don't, I don't think, I don't think that would make sense. Well, it tells me is if you've got a teenager in the car who's still alive, and then Stephen trashes the backpack and the laptop, wouldn't wouldn't there be signs of life right like like if if i'm 13 and someone's pitching my stuff and i'm still up i'm gonna jump out and, and you know why what are you doing why why all this um i'm a little, a little disturbed that he drove to the school at 10 after 8 now if we go by what sheriff mina says she's already dead why are you driving by the school with a dead body 
unless it's in the trunk. Otherwise, you get, you've seen it. I mean, that, that would put you into some, you're at a school. There's liable to be crossing guards, school resource officers, people to see you. Um, so that, that kind of distresses me as part of the timeline that he would drive to the school. Um, if you say we, we, we've got the reader kind of leaving the school at 10 after 8, and he's back in the uh, apartment complex 819, that's pretty quick. Going that's from Hunters Creek now, to that, that's the Western Zone of Kissimmee, that's pretty quick. Right, and we're not sure where the license plate reader is. What we know is it's it's driving away from the school. So whether it's 10 minutes away from the school, five minutes away from the school, um, it's not clear. But what is what is clear, and we have another guest joining us. Uh, we've just hooked up with, uh, uh, in Michigan City, Indiana, private investigator, found him, founder of Victims News Online, Erica Morse. Erica... Um, you've investigated a lot of cases. Yeah, and before we start with Erica, she's actually not helping. They said she's did that one interview. She's actually lawyered up, everybody. She's in a mental hospital, and she's lawyered up. So she did one interview, and she hasn't filled them in as far as we know about any of these time gaps that we're talking about. We're trying to figure it out, and we may figure it out before she even talks. The one person that can tell us. Cases. Unfortunately, involving missing children, she's got someone with a dead body in the car doing all of this back and forth. Um, what does that tell you if that's what happened? Is, is this unusual from your perspective? Is this like something, something really, really strange is happening? Is it panic or is it trying to set up some sort of an alibi here? So last week when we talked about this, Vinny, you and I were both very frustrated by the discrepancies and some of those missing minutes in that, that window. What I went back and did is looked at mom's interviews again, and mom made a reference in one of them to coming home around 8 a.m. or a little after 8. And I think it may have been panic. I think he may have needed to get her out of the house. Additionally, both mom and offender said that we dropped her off sure did. in separate interviews. And that's a problem for me. Um, they weren't interviewed together when they made these slips. And I, I think that that's exactly what it was. Um, I don't know. I've been thinking about this and I'm starting to wonder if he only went back for the clicker um, or if he may have also gone back for mom. For See? Mom. See, we don't know that it wasn't Jen Soto in the car. We don't know that. We don't know that Maddie wasn't in the trunk or in the back seat, and that that wasn't Jen. They look eerily similar. They're about the same height, and we just don't know. We haven't seen the footage, and we, we don't know. So it, it's not just us speculating. It's all of these people thinking the same exact thing. It's a possibility. Joel, have you been as confused as we've been by this this scurrying around in the morning? And you've got the sheriff saying that he's moving her body around. That's what they believe. But where is he going and why is why all these movements? Uh, a thousand percent. I've been confused. And uh, to your point, I think it is panic coupled with chaos. Um, whatever time this murder occurred, uh, Stefan Stearns obviously was trying to figure out how to how to hide this body. But it is so bizarre that they uh, would catch him uh, dropping these uh, backpack and the laptop into the dumpster at 735 or so, but then driving to the schools. So you have to wonder if he's creating an alibi. Uh, but to the private investigator's point, that is something that we analyzed as well on our show, uh, looking at those initial interviews. And by the way, if you're committing a crime, you probably shouldn't be doing uh, TV interviews uh, ahead of time because people are going back and looking at those. And uh, she does, in fact, say he dropped her off and then slips and say, says we, and he does the same thing. So what on earth is going on here? I mean, you have to think, um, and I hate to say this to a grieving mother, that in one fashion or another, she's complicit, whether she's covering for Stefan Stearns or it's something more sinister. But Yeah, grieving mother, not so much, Joel. And I know you're trying to tread lightly here, but yeah. Grieving mother is what we don't see. Something just does not sit right, does not smell right. 
uh, that this is a horrific, horrific crime. You know, the other thing that's baffling here, Gray, is we just saw the video of the dumpster. And, I mean, the camera couldn't be, like, more obvious. It's it's right there. It's like the camera's in front of me. It's It's unreal. Like, here's the dumpster cam. Like, do you not see that? Do you not notice that? Yeah. It's right there. Boom! Yeah, I mean, that's, one of the th Smile. that's one of the things that makes it, yeah. They were in a panic, too. So you saw them in the interviews. We've been studying them. We've watched them tens of times already. I guess that's what makes it seem like he is sort of panicking. Something happened. Uh, he gets up and does all these things. Now, uh, here's one thing I will tell you. I think I looked up where the uh, the license plate readers are, okay? And one of them that I found was at uh, the intersection of West Donegan Avenue and John Young Parkway, which is that straight, long street that goes down, that, that you would take to get down to the main 192 and then go back to the apartments. So it, it sort of makes sense that at 810, that would be there. Uh, so I'll show, I'll show you off the air where that is, then you can uh, yeah, update uh, people but, later. But, but of course you're on top of it, Gray. I, I gave you the 30 seconds and boom, <laughs> you found this. Okay, stay where you are, everyone. Um, everyone's uh, staying with us. When we come back, we're going to talk about the flat tire. Because he did change a tire. Was it really flat? How did... All right, let's... During this time... And you guys put your comments if you think that it was flat. I think that he really did have a flat tire, everybody, and that he made a mistake because he had a flat tire and somebody caught him having that flat tire. And it was so, like, it was such a panic where you see the body being dumped. That was not a good spot. That was, like, wide open. So I think it was a flat tire and he got caught. Our investigators combed through a significant number of tips, and on March 1st, we received information placing Stern's vehicle in a rural area of St. Cloud, where ultimately Madeline's body was discovered. It was a tip. It was a tip. So significant in all of this. And that's, that's why publicity around a missing person is so important. And social media sometimes when we're not fighting everybody. The awareness of the public that maybe you saw something and you wouldn't know it's important unless you knew about this story in this case and this missing girl. And it happened. Take a look. This was posted on Facebook uh, March 1st uh, from Thomas Karras. I gave the pictures to Osceola County law enforcement as they started their search and they found where I said I saw him. I saw him around 120 Monday. An old hickory tree pull over on a roundabout that has a cargo shipping container. He was in on the right-hand side heading towards Harmony. He was wearing a green light brown hat backwards. I didn't see anyone else in the vehicle. He was outside the car at the back left tire with a tire iron. Looked like he was changing it but couldn't say for sure. All this stuff. Seems like it pans out. Got the See? You guys could see it right on the screen. If you're watching it on TV, you could see that huge. This was from Facebook, everybody. A lot of people make fun of Facebook and say, oh, there's only old people. Well, guess what? We're trying to get justice and we're trying to help out these cases. And we are. We are helping out. And you can see how it all crosses over today. So look at that right there. Boom. I think he had a flat tire and dumped her and did a sloppy job. The name of the road wrong. It's it's Hickory Tree. Um, not old hickory tree. Let's um, let's take a listen. Uh, Cody Thomas, our producer, was down there and, and kind of walks us around the area where this flat tire was. Now, just across the street here in this area, this little divot off of Hickory Road is where a witness online describes where he saw Stephen Stearns kneeling down, changing a tire that morning of February 26th when Maddie Soto went missing. Now, you can see it's just a little gravi gravel divot a lot of flat land back here, private farmland. Now, police described the area they saw that flat tire situation on Old Hickory Road. There's an Old Hickory Road and a Hickory Road. Hickory Road, again, across the street where Madeline Soto's body was found. So there could be a little confusion as far as what witnesses may or may not have saw between the two, that is Hickory Road and Old Hickory Road. But one thing we do know, again, right across the street, and that tree line behind that memorial over the fence is where Madeline Soto's body was found on March 1st. 
And one other thing we know is that that back left tire, which was photographed, was changed. That's 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 a spare. That is that is clear. Ken Jackson, Osceola News Gazette. Um, this witness coming forward, I think, was the only way you were going to find her in a timely fashion. Well, that may have been one of the tips that uh, the that police used to to find her on that Friday. I know there were uh, about four or five locations between. Orange and Osceola County that police were looking for either her or, or the body. Um, something that they noted about at this at this site there, um, your your producer you know walked around that gravel area which is across the street from the bushes where the body was found. Now um, on the other side of the street, that that right there you're seeing that is on. Has everybody seen where her? where the, her body was dumped. I hate to say it that way, but that's how they're saying it. If you see where her body was dumped, it was just kind of tossed out there by the bushes. There was no hiding it or trying to conceal it. So, yeah, that's what they're talking about right now, and you can probably find that, or we can go back in a video. Check out my playlist on this. On the opposite side of the street where it was found, on the same side of the street, there is a little alcove there where someone who's driving down the road would be able to pull off as well. Um, okay, maybe I'm, I'm coming from a common sense point of if you were going to be dumping something like a body there, you would be on the same side of the street, get it done quickly. You know, we, we've got them in that area between 1 and 2.30, which is broad daylight, an odd time to be doing something like that. I would do it in the middle of the night, not that I have a point of reference for it. Um, but that, so, that makes a lot of sense, right, start, rather than cross the street <laughs> with, with the body. Let, let me ask you, Erica Morris, this 120 time to me is significant. And I'm wondering what you're thinking. Mom is going to pick her up at four. This is the routine. The routine is to pick her up at four. The school at the time, they've now changed what they do, but the school doesn't call you until the end of the day to tell you that your child wasn't there. So if mom is totally out of the loop, he's got to get this done. He can't wait till after dark and have a body in the car if mom doesn't know about this. If mom doesn't know about this, I would be very surprised if she wasn't there. I wouldn't be that surprised, but her not knowing about the sexual abuse all these years, and there being some kind of love triangle, every single picture that he's in, Stefan Stearns is in with the two. He's paying attention to Maddie. Every single one of them, you can see it. And she just exposes her little girl to that monster. So let's expose her, everybody, because I'm on the expose Hashtag expose Jen Soto. Correct. And we are still unclear as to what mom knows because she's already um, given inaccurate slash false statements to the police about this. Jen. Um, I'm trying to think here. Sorry, I lost the question. Can you go back to it again, Vinny? I apologize. Well, I was saying the, the time, 120. He's up against it because, you know, the yeah. end of the school yeah. day is the end of the school day. That's when it's going to be very apparent that Madeline did not go to school. Correct. Yeah. Sorry, I was going back to that gate. Yeah, he definitely had to do it. And when we talked about this last week, we were talking about him, I think, just driving out in the middle of nowhere and trying to find an available um, spot. And I think that gate being open on that particular day, that cattle owner, that rancher who feels horrible, feels very guilty that he left that gate open. And I, I really think he would have just I think she would have ended up in the first available spot. I think that he chose that out of opportunity more than anything. But whether it's a mom, whether it's a bus driver, whether it's a teacher, whether it's somebody, some adult was going to begin trying to account for this child's whereabouts around 4 p.m. Gray Hughes, um, that's, that area, like he is spotted there. And, I, and I'm wondering, it, it, in his mind, does he have to be, have a reason to pull over? And that's why there's a flat tire if he is seen because he's no, he's got to know that there's cars driving by that may be able to identify him. But then on the other hand, it makes no sense to leave the body where you have stopped your car because that could lead to you the way it did right here. He was also high that morning and many other times. He was a, what his friends call a big partier. He was high on weed and who knows what else. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that um, I think that it is an, an actual flat tire that he had, and I think he was heading somewhere else much further away to put her body uh, in the woods somewhere where nobody could find her. 
And that's why he's on the other side of the road. And then he, uh, he stopped as fast as he could because he's not going to want to drive around where a police officer is going to have to uh, you know pull over and ask what's going on. So he literally, I think he is fixing the tire because we see that it's replaced. And then he carries her body across and puts it over there and was, you know, lucky. He probably picked the spot. You can drive on a bad tire for a little bit of time. So he looked over there and he saw that gate's open and then he walked over there. And that's why she's so close to the road. Yes. And I, I, I tend to believe that he literally got a flat tire and it was a miracle because the thing is when you, when you have a flat tire, everybody remembers, right? Right. Listen to this. Everybody remembers when someone has a flat tire. And yes, everybody's saying it's a miracle. Thank God that he had a flat tire to connect it so quickly, because otherwise we'd be having a missing Maddie right now. If he would have hit her somewhere else that it was hard to find, we'd be having these large search parties with where they're spending exorbitant amounts of money and they still didn't find her. So thank God for that flat tire, everybody. They drive by and go, oh, there's this guy that had a flat tire. If you just pull over and park, you're not likely to be remembered because it's just a car pulled over on the side of the road. But if it has a flat tire, you, you turn your head, look to see if somebody needs help, and you notice it. So that would be a stupid thing to do strategically. Yeah. Um, Joel Wolman, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this whole thing, the way it has played out. It doesn't seem like it's planned out at all. It seems very reactive. Yes, it does. A hundred percent witty on that, and with Gray Hughes as well. Uh, I'm on his side when it comes to uh, his take on what happened. Look, I think we're trying to uh, compute this and trying to make sense of this uh, when this uh, act was done in a completely irrational way. I don't think Stefan Stearns had any sense of uh, you know mind at the time. I think he was all over the place, and there'd be absolutely no reason. Uh, if, if you go back to that um, timeline, 810, he drives by Hunter's Creek Middle School. In that case, maybe he's trying to set up an alibi so someone sees him and says, oh, he dropped her off at school. In this case, what upside potential is there for him to get a flat tire uh, for anyone to see him when he's that many miles away? And that's where they discover the body. There's absolutely no chance he did it on purpose. I think he had a flat tire. It was bad luck. And this might be but ultimately could get him the death penalty uh, if he is charged with murder here. Absolutely. And he will be charged with murder, everybody. They're, an indictment's coming. They're just, like I said, it's either Jen's going to flip on him and talk, or we're going to have two trials going on, but he's going to be indicted for murder. They're just taking their time because he's locked up for all the sex crimes, 36 pages of horrible sex crimes that nobody needs to see or read. And, and the point where we are in this entire investigation is um, the last we've heard from Kissimmee PD, they're putting together the timeline, they're working with the state attorney's office as well. Uh, they're in no rush because Stefan Stearns, as the prime suspect, is already in custody for all the charges related to what was found or allegedly found on his phone. Uh, a big thank you to everyone tonight. Joel Waldman, host of the Surviving the Survivor podcast, Ken Jackson, Osceola News Gazette, Eric Morris, private investigator, and Gray Hughes. Gray Hughes investigates on YouTube. Great to see everyone tonight. Thank you for... All right, and thank you all for coming today. This was a wild episode today after last night. Um, we did the episode last night, and we did the Deception Detective, and we did Madeline. I'm sorry, not Madeline. We did Jennifer Soto and Stefan Stearns, and I think everybody was on the same page. I didn't have anybody telling me that they thought that Jennifer Soto was innocent at the end of that. So if you guys... You know, if you guys think that, please hashtag Jen Soto, hashtag exposed, hashtag Jennifer Soto, hashtag exposed. I can see the comments flying by. There's 516 people in my chat, and I hope all of you guys can like, subscribe, and share. Not just for me, but please, let's get Jen Soto exposed, and let's get her arrested everybody let's get an indictment against her so that we can fill in those gaps and not just speculate because right now we are speculating but we're really correct in our speculation we're, we're using logic and ration we're not using emotion even though i'm pissed off i'm a mom of a beautiful daughter and a beautiful son and i feel 
all of the feelings, okay? So I'm with you. Hit that like, subscribe, share, everybody. Until I see you next time, we're out of here, everybody. Thank you so much. Hit that like and subscribe on your way out. Guilty of crime. I want to thank you for watching. If you enjoyed my content, please share this video, like, and subscribe. You can also follow me over at Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, X, or Gmail. If you'd like to donate to my channel, you can use Cash App or Venmo or PayPal. Thank you very much in advance. Guilty of crime. Are you guilty?